I'm going to read you a story that I've written um, that happened quite a while ago. It's called Coming Home to Cindy. The small, light blue Fiat sports car purred down US 99 as we approached Fresno. It had been seven months since I'd driven a car, and it took a while to get the feel of the steering and the engine and the braking. Then driving slowly became automatic. You forget how much of life is routine and unnoticed until you're away from it for a while. Kay said, looks like you're getting the feel for it. I thought I was going to have to give you a lesson. And then she finally relaxed, and then she dozed. It had been her car for the past year, and now, with a brand new, Navy, brand new baby, <laughs> we would need something bigger, a sedan, a station wagon. A phase of our lives was ending, but for now, we really enjoyed being together again and emerging ourselves in the final days <coughs> of our carefree lives slowing for the many towns and small communities that interrupted the flow of traffic. We were driving south on US 99 before there was an interstate. Farms blanketed the sides of the highway. This was the rich, fertile Central Valley of California. The late November days were short and the sun set quickly over the coastal range to the west. As it grew dark, we stopped for a quick meal and I had to decide what to order. Having choices was great. Although, it was a challenge, too, since so many decisions had been made for me over the past several months. I've had a lot of homecomings in my life. During my 26 years in the Navy, there were seven that followed long deployments, and long means at least six months, and shorter ones without number. It's an accepted, although unpleasant and unnatural part of naval service. I learned a lot about the thrill of coming home from a long separation and the major adjustment that was necessary. Each homecoming has its own surprises, a house I'd never seen, children older and more mature, although understandably distant. Well, it won't be long until he's off again, they must have thought. The only thing that never changed was the rapid shift from a highly structured exclusively male existence, to a freer but much more chaotic life with children and family entering and leaving and disrupting the ordered sense of place. The transition to a family following a deployment always posed a lot of interesting and challenging issues, reforming the relationships, learning to share chores, recognizing the amazing feat that had taken place where a young, inexperienced wife has taken on tremendous responsibilities all on her own. Some of the particularly strict and conforming officers never could successfully make the shift. They expected to pick up things exactly where they had left them and to once again be in charge. Our executive officer demanded that the kids, the three that came with his new wife, knock their shoes together before, to get rid of any dirt before they got into his car. They quickly divorced. <laughs> Driving tr through the encroaching gloom, I thought, last week I was fully integrated into the life of a carrier pilot. Now I'm uncertain about who I am and what I am supposed to be and what to do. I can't even order my own meal without help. On the ship, we carried on the traditions from the Royal Navy that had evolved centuries earlier. There are about 300 officers in the wardroom mess, half from the air group and half from the ship's company. Carriers have a much bigger complement now. And dinner was a special ritual with the junior officers eating first and the senior officers an hour later. The tables were adorned in white linen and the silver was real, part of a service that was given to the ship during the commissioning ceremony. We sat in order of our seniority, strictly, and we remained standing until the senior officer gave us permission to take our seats. Conversation was orderly and conventional with three topics strictly forbidden, religion, politics, and sex. The stewards, 
Largely Filipinos and African Americans were dressed in starched white uniforms and were attentive and unseen. Transplants from a British period cinema. Mixed into the orderliness and structure, the 50s held a secret, really secret. We were part of the nuclear attack capability that the US possessed. This was at the beginning of the heating up stages of the Cold War. So those of us on alert were dressed in flight suits and were excluded from the formal dining room. At any time of day or night, we could be airborne in less than 10 minutes on a nuclear strike mission. Baked Alaska for dinner and baked Russian city for breakfast. 1959 was one of those years. This is my second cruise, and it followed a short gap between deployments. It was short, but it was long enough to get my wife Kay pregnant. That meant leaving my 20-year-old bride on her own for <coughs> six months. She opted to return to her mother's home, which really was a good decision. However, moving back home wasn't easy after having been on her own for a couple of years especially since she is pretty strong-willed. But she and her mother worked out a shaky agreement, mostly to provide a warm environment for the upcoming arrival of the first granddaughter. Our daughter, Cindy, was born six weeks before my return from the Far East and our months on nuclear alert. Almost all communication was by snail mail delivered to the ship occasionally by a COD, a carrier on board delivery aircraft. But I did receive a short telegram. Congratulations, you're the father of a baby girl, mother and child both doing well. After a couple of weeks, a letter arrived that contained a photo of my new daughter. Now I don't know if you have seen pictures or photographs of newborns from that era, but in case you haven't, let me describe it. It was small, perhaps three by four inches, glossy, black and white, fuzzy and slightly out of focus. Those are the technical details. The little person in the photo was barely recognizable as a human being. <laughs> Her cheeks were puffy and blotched and looked dark because of the newborn rash. Her hair was sparse and was hardly subdued by an attempt at putting it in order. In short, she looked exactly like Winston Churchill <laughs> with, without a cigar. Of course, I showed it off and was a proud papa distributing Philippine cigars to my squadron mates, even though I knew that this photo was right after her birth, and I knew that she would be a beautiful girl. But deep inside, I was a little disappointed. <laughs> at the appearance of my wonderful new daughter. For a small fee, I will show you a copy of that picture a little later. When we arrived at the Naval Air Station in Alameda on the east side of San Francisco Bay, Kay was there to meet me. But Cindy had been deemed too young to travel and so she stayed with her grandmother in Phoenix. As soon as possible, I left the ship with leave papers in hand and we hit the road. It was a long drive to Phoenix from the Bay Area, well over 12 hours. But we were young, and this would give us a chance to re become reacquainted. I just turned 23, and Kay would be 21 the following month. The days were short, and most of the driving was at night. But on the positive side, that meant the traffic going through LA was light. The freeway system was not completed yet, so it was a tortuous, slow slog through the center of LA then the 50, 60, 89 direct to Phoenix. The highway went within a mile of my parents' home in West Covina. My aged grandmother was staying with them at the time and had been for several months. She was well into her 80s and had become even more rigid and cold than when she was younger. My grandmother Booth, from whence comes my middle name, was born in Ilkeston in the English Midlands. She and my grandfather, together with their three children at the time, immigrated to this country in the early years of the 20th century. Three more were born after their arrival, including my mother and her twin sister. When we were young, my brother and I 
stayed with my grandparents during the summer and after school. We were boisterous and noisy and needed to be outside and otherwise entertain. She taught us to crochet. <laughs> that was okay, but we would have rather been playing football or war. <laughs> Tea with milk, sipped or rather slurped from a saucer was ever present, as was the bitter marmalade and toast. She knitted and sent sweaters to the Royal Navy sailors during the war. We didn't learn to knit. But she was certainly not the warm, playful grandmother that my mother and my wife Kay would become. Because of the delays in getting off the ship and signing out on leave, we had driven through the night and arrived in West Covina in the very early morning. I said, Kay, I think we really should stop at least for a couple of minutes. She said, they're all asleep and we'll be back in a couple of days. And then we'll have Cindy with us. That's who they really want to see. Kay was in a hurry to get back to her daughter, um, our daughter. I must have thought I owed her after having been gone for so long, and I didn't want to overassert myself. You give and take, you learn to get along. So we went straight through and on to Phoenix. That was a perfectly understandable decision to make at the time. I'm sure of it. Given the thinking process of a couple barely out of their teens, tired and goal-directed, it seemed like a reasonable, logical choice to make. Seeing Cindy was great. She was a dream baby, thank God. And there is nothing like holding your first child warm and soft and exuding baby oil and powder. A couple of days after our arrival in Phoenix, we got a call from my mother. My grandmother had passed away, and our haste had erased the last opportunity we would ever have to see her alive. I'm sure my mother was upset that we didn't stop for a couple of minutes, especially when my grandmother died. I remember a little anxiety and sense of having made a decision that was perhaps not particularly smart at the time. Now, having lived a long and full life, I can better understand our priorities and our thought processes. But at the time, my only thought was, the future is waiting for us and I'm impatient to meet her. Thanks. <laughs> Ron Pickett.